my name's Peter Leonard, will come to me in a minute. Um, but I'm guessing that if you all come here because you want to make content like this. Great, isn't it? How amazing. Of course you want to make stuff like that, it's brilliant. Um, maybe some of you are more interested in um, things like this. This is Brian Cox explaining a bit about how gravity works. So there you go, Brian Cox doing GCSE physics on a very, very grand scale. Um, it's very cool. Um, they're both from the BBC. They were both done some while ago now. When I started making films, they were transmitted and that was it. But of course now things stick around on, online and so on. And both of these clips have done quite well on YouTube. The iguanas from the clip I looked at got 20 million, gravity got 23 million. Now, I'm not saying one, better, one is better than the other, but I was the series producer that was responsible for the gravity clip, so just saying. Okay, so who am I? I'm Peter Leonard. I work at the National Film and Television School, um, running the Science and Natural History MA programme. But I used to work um, in television. I worked on all kinds of things at the BBC. I started off as an editor and then ended up doing things like Crime Watch, and but for the past 20 or so years I've been doing science. Here is me filming science. That's at um, a place in Puerto Rico called the Arecibo Radio Telescope. Um, it blew down in a hurricane, it's not there anymore, but pretty impressive when it was. Um, that's us making a film about pandemic, the next pandemic and what it might be like. This was in about 2010. We thought we were being really responsible and a bit crazy and overdramatic. Turns out we weren't. Um, anyway, so now I'm running this course at the NFTS. Enough about me though. So this is about science and natural history. What does that mean in terms of television? We all know what it means in terms of, I suppose, school subjects. But in TV, it's not quite what perhaps you think it is. I would say, and I would argue that natural history is part of science. But in the TV industry, they tend to be very different things done in very different places by very different people. Um, natural history, it's about animals and plants, specifically about animal behavior and plant behavior. Okay? Usually in pristine conditions, away from what people do. So what does that leave for science? Everything else. So what does that mean? everything from, that's just a few, there are more. But what I think is that you can tell any story through the lens of science. So science actually becomes a very powerful thing, a standpoint from which to tell stories. Okay, so it's a really, really exciting field, I think. There are great benefits. You get to do quite a lot of travel. You get to work outside. If you like animals, your quid's in. Um, that brain is from a show that I made about OCD. We got somebody at St. George's Medical School to take us around the brain, human brain, in reality. But mainly I like it because it's a challenge. It's an intellectual challenge and it's a practical challenge. So what do I mean by that? Let's look at natural history. Okay, natural history. Find an animal and film it, right? Kind of. There's a bit more to it. Sometimes things are very difficult to film, and they're difficult to film because of what I call the impossible seven, okay? You can read that, I'll read it for you if you're having trouble. Some things are too far, too slow, too small, and so on, okay? So I'm gonna show you a clip from a film that one of our students made a couple of years ago about kingfishers. He wanted to do a film about um, the struggles that a kingfisher pair have along their stretch of riverbank a lot, uh, through a year. So how do you do it? Well, there are some obvious things. You use telephoto lenses. 
um, they're a long way away. You need to be a long way away using a long lens and bring it near to you. In fact, there's a formula, a nerdy formula you can use. If you know the size of the thing you're filming, you know how far away you are and you know how big your camera sensor is, you can do some maths and work out which length of lens you need. So he used that. But he also used a machine called a phantom camera, which is a video camera that shoots things at very high frame rates. Ordinary television shoots at 25 frames a second. This thing shoots at several hundred frames a second, up to, well, up into the thousands of frames a second. So you can see things that you otherwise wouldn't see. If you were to watch the kingfisher fishing, if you were lucky enough to see one fish, you'd just see a splash and that'd be done. Whereas that, you can spread out the time see exactly what's going on, and you end up with a beautiful sequence. Um, he also had fish in tanks underneath that thing, so he knew where they were going to fish. <laughs> um, tricks of the trade. So um, that's it. That's a couple of the Impossible 7 sorted out. They're the relatively easy ones, I would say. Um, let's have a look at some of the others. What do you do when you come to science? Like I said, slightly tongue-in-cheek, you find an animal and you film it. There is more to it, of course, but nonetheless, they're there. With science, you're dealing a lot of the time with concepts, with ideas, things you can't see. Um, and what kind of challenges do we, do we find with that? So let's think about a kind of fairly standard science thing. Space, the solar system. What are the problems that you come up against trying to do things about astronomy? Possibly. Too far away. Too far away, yeah, we're good. I think it's too big and it's too far away. If you think about, if you try to do a scale model of the solar system, which mind-bogglingly is only a tiny part of the universe, you would be, your planets would be pixels on a TV screen of this size. You just couldn't really see it. So. How do you do it? You could have a dull diagram like that. For those of you who are interested, the sun's at the middle. You've got the um, Kuiper belt and then the Oort cloud right at the edge. And that really doesn't tell you anything. Or you can have a chart like this. So it shows you where everything is and you get some sense of scale. But even with that, that's a logarithmic scale. So that doesn't really tell you anything. But television is a visual medium. You've got to think of something to explain this stuff because it's interesting. You could do it like this. Right, there's Brian Cox when he was um, almost famous. It's the wonders of the solar system. That was his first big hit. But I think that this is sort of his stock and trade, but how extraordinary to think about scale in that sense. You know, we think the moon's a long way away and then our nearest star, other than the sun, four light years away. That's you, when you talk about astronomy and the, the solar system and the universe, you very quickly start talking about hundreds of light years and stuff like that. Four light years, that's, a, that's light, traveling at the speed of light for four years. And that's a local star. It's anyway. So um, that's you know by way of analogy to demonstrate what you can't what you can't necessarily rush off and film for real. Um, but what about if um, you know you can't see things at all? At least you, you, the solar system is there. It's tangible. It's a thing. We can see bits of it. Um, what about stuff that you can't see? So. When you get into cosmology, you very soon find things like dark matter. Now, dark matter is supposed to make up 25% of the universe's mass and that along with dark energy. Anyway, all of this stuff is impossible to see by definition. And yet it's fascinating. It deserves coverage. It's, it's, cosmology is nuts. Um, and I had to make a film about it. So now we're into some of these other things, what, what, what are we looking at here? Well, the film that we made about dark matter and dark energy, you're into too big, too far away, invisible and intangible, all those things. And yet you need to make a TV program. And the one thing you can't do, don't like it, is just a black screen, right? So you have to think of something. 
this is what we did a few years ago. Okay, that's um, Professor Mike Disney from Cardiff University, Emeritus Professor, um, distant relative of Walt, uh, who thinks it's all a put-up job and nonsense. Um, so we were trying to find a visual quality to kind of demonstrate some of the things that they were talking about, and we did that in a number of different ways. First of all, we used a product called Swell Gel, which is something you put in pot plants to keep them moist. Okay, so it looks like sand. When you put water on it, these individual grains of sand swell up to about one or two centimeter cube pieces of clear jelly. And we put them in a tank. And, uh, oh, this is in the wrong order. Never mind. Let's find it. Okay. So, what we did, we had a tank in a studio and we had all of these jelly, jelly little transparent jellies. When you put ink in them, the ink kind of goes round them and reveals them to be there when you can't see them. So that was one of the kind of graphics-y things we did and um, graded it so it looked all a bit weird and purple. So whenever we wanted to talk about dark matter, we could kind of resort to these kind, this kind of imagery. Another thing we did when we introduced our contributors, that's Carlos Frank from Durham, we used the warpy effect in the AVID to kind of refer to something called gravitational lensing, which we come to in the program. So dark matter is inferred by light being warped in places that you wouldn't expect it to be warped in. So that's a nod in that direction. And we made all our interviewees where we could, very sort of one-sided, so light and dark. So that's the kind of thing we did. The other thing we did was we got um, graphics to take things away from normal scenes. So wouldn't it be odd if you saw people playing tennis without tennis rackets? What we did actually was to get them to pretend to play tennis and then we put a tennis ball in afterwards. Um, we didn't actually take the racket anyway. Um, and there's a boy in a swing that isn't there. And that's the coolest one, which I've messed up the order again, I'm sorry. That's in the bar and we had the graphics people make the drink. Um, anyway, so there it is. Um, so there's one more impossible. In fact, there's one of these that I've missed. Someone tell me what I've missed. Too slow, too slow. What are the kind of too slow things that we might come up against? Yep. There's a really good clip that I should have got. I apologize. If you watch um, ITV's um, A Year on Planet Earth, made by our friends at Plimpsoul Productions in Bristol, and specifically by my friend Seb Illis. Um, they talk about the seasons in the world and what happens and so on. And what they've got, they've got this big valley somewhere in the States, and they fly a drone down it in different seasons and then dissolve between the different shots. So you can see the, see the seasons change in the space of about 20 seconds. The reason you can do that was with drones now, you can GPS lock them so you can make them fly in exactly the same place again and again and again once you've recorded the flight path, which is something you couldn't do with a helicopter. And it's something that you couldn't do with drones until relatively recently. Okay, so there's one more possibility that I haven't talked about. Um, doesn't involve any of these. I suppose arguably it's intangible, and that is maths. How do we deal with maths? Trouble is there's ordinary maths and then there's weird maths as well. So I'm gonna show you the beginning of a program that a friend of mine made about infinity. Terrifying, isn't it? There's somebody else somewhere else in the universe doing this now, and there's those of you doing this anyway. Um, that's made by a director called Stephen Kusher, and if you look at Stephen's work, you often find a monkey in it, so he was very pleased to be able to legitimately have the infant monkey in there. Um, so infinity is really popular. It's one of those popular science things because it's so mind-bending, and um, there was a Netflix um, documentary that came out last year. I'll just show you the trailer for that made in a very different way. Interesting to compare. So 
So they were made uh, roughly 10 years apart um, and very, very different approaches. It's slightly unfair to compare the two because one's a trail and one isn't. But Stephen went for a very kind of organic thing with actors and situations. Um, these guys went with different types of graphics and making their own sort of fake Disney, early Disney cartoons and things. They covered exactly the same territory. Um, it was a matter of taste, I guess. None are, none's right, none's wrong. But it shows that when you're trying to do something intangible, you have to find a visual language and uh, two examples. The same is true in natural history. I've concentrated a lot on science. Um, but I just wanted to show you a little clip from a film that one of our students did last year about um, animal senses, about bees in this case. So how do you demonstrate that? Okay, so what I quite liked about that was that you don't really, you kind of vaguely understand what's happening, but you almost have like an emotional response to it and a visceral response. It talks about rubbing the jumper on, on balloons and, you know, that having that little sound of the, the static, electrostatic going on in the background. You kind of, you're drawn in, I think. And that's the other thing that films have to do. You know, science, even science, even maths has to be in some way emotionally engaging because television is visual, but it's also an emotional medium and if you don't kind of grab people in that way then they'll lose interest okay so i wanted to finish by talking a little bit again about the differences between science and natural history you know do you have to choose okay so let's just remind ourselves about what tv considers the differences between science and natural history to be here are the definitions okay as i said they used to be very separate but using Venn diagrams, let's go all properly GCSE maths again. Um, there are some, there is some interconnect, some obvious interconnect, even if you choose to separate them. And I think if you're thinking about science and natural history, see what I did there, science and natural history, what are the overlapping things? And I think it's not controversial to say that conservation, ecology, climate science, they're all things that kind of overlap massively. And of course, those things are crucially important going forward and very difficult to get right. Um, it's a big turnoff in terms of viewers. People don't really want to know <laughs> about terrible things that are happening to our planet. So how do you do that? Well, question for another day. But what else might be at the intersection between science and natural history? Would it surprise you to say, Cosmology, I think it probably would. It would have surprised me until a year or two ago when our friends at BBC Studios made this series for Netflix, which is called Our Universe. So this is um, the natural world against the biggest picture of all. Um, and I urge you to watch it. It's interesting. It's a little bit Marmite. Some people think it works brilliantly. Some people aren't so keen. But nonetheless, it shows that it is possible to marry those two things that have been so far split, split apart in the TV industry. So now when you're considering your futures your careers i would say now is there hasn't been a better time to get involved in this area of filmmaking because you know the doors to doing so much more integrated things are open and it is challenging you are asked to kind of do things which you might consider are impossible till you think about them for a little while but i think it's a great way to spend some of your limited time on this planet, in this part of the universe. Because, as someone once said, it's kind of fun to do the impossible. Even though his great great niece, or whoever my Disney is, thinks it's all a put up job. But anyway, it's an exciting time to be in the field. Um, and if you do want to talk to us about 
National Film and Television School. Oh, look, we do a course. Um, you can find us online. That's the end of my talk. Um, do we have any questions that you'd like to answer, ask me? I'll do my best. I can't promise that I have an answer. Hello. My background is in researching, um, but wanting to get into film and TV, I very foolishly did a degree in film and TV, and now want to get into um, this sort of thing. Uh -huh. um, is it something in terms of researching? Is it a barrier if you don't have an um, academic degree or anything in sciences or in natural history? And if so, how can you circumnavigate that kind of thing? Um, well, no, it's not a barrier. I mean, the default thing to go and work at the Natural History Unit in Bristol tends to be zoology, but I certainly don't require people to have a natural sciences degree to come and do our course. And I actually think that some of the best, best filmmakers there are in the science field haven't got science backgrounds because, you know, you see things from the point of view of the audience. When I made the film, I mean, I, I've got a chemistry degree, right? But so long ago that I'd forgotten most, I was rubbish at it anyway. When I came to make that Horizon film about cosmology, I know nothing about cosmology. And my chemistry degree didn't help me at all. So, you know, I think that you have to be, you know, if you're the key thing for a career in any part of the industry, but in this is always passion. And if you keep on knocking on doors and demonstrating to people that you want to do something, someone will give you a go. You know, if you want to get in right into the kind of hardcore natural history, to, you know, natural history unit at the BBC, um, you might find it more difficult. You might not. It depends what your background is and what you've done. But no, I mean, the short, that's a very long rambling answer. The short answer is no, don't let that stop you. If you're passionate about an area of television, go for it. It's largely about the passion. Um, hi, I don't really know anything about how these sorts of films are made, but there seem to be a lot of elements. So there's obviously, if you particularly take some of the things like the cosmology, there's, yeah. you know, there's a lot of graphics, there's a lot of concepts, mm -hmm. there's a person with, there's a voiceover, you know, mm -hmm. there's just an awful lot of, you know, a, Home, a script also and Bilbo so on. Baggins, he um, narrated that. <laughs> yeah. What's the process of pulling all of that together? Because... Um, oh, my goodness. Um, well... What happens generally is that you get a certain period of time to research everything and write a script. We write a script before we go and film something. So for Horizon, let's just take that as an example. We got, say, two months research where we would have a small group of people, me and a researcher and an assistant producer maybe, to research the subject. There's a stage before that where it's decided that that's what the film's going to be about. We won't go into that. And then you have to kind of phone people up, talk to people, work out what the story is, really, uh, write a script, which is a kind of made-up version of what you think the film will be like. And then we used to get, I think, 14 days filming. Um, so you run around and film all the things that you need to film based on the script that you've imagined. And then you get a couple of months to edit it with an editor as well. So that's kind of the time scale. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Well, is that all conceived at the script? It should be. It very often isn't. Very often what happens is that you get halfway through the edit and you think, oh no, how am I going to, this has changed and that's changed. Quick, we need some graphics. So anybody who wants to get it, remember this, right? This is important. This is free for me. When you've got your budget and you're doing your filming and you've got a line in your budget for graphics, make sure that you don't spend it because the temptation is to go, oh, we won't need graphics. We'll just kind of, we'll have an extra day filming or we'll go up this mountain. It'd be brilliant. And then you come to the edit and you find that you do need the graphics. Don't spend your graphics budget. Likewise, archive. Don't spend that either. Does that answer your question? Anybody else? Yeah. Um, yeah. The two roles that are up there, directing and producing, yeah. do you see those as very distinct no. roles that people go after no. or, or a hybrid, a hybrid between the two? No. Okay. So in the film industry, in movies, you have a producer and you have a director. Okay. Largely in television, in factual television anyway, which is what this is, that you will be editorially responsible for your programme if you are a producer and you will also direct it as well. So when I was working on Horizon, I was what was called a producer director. 
So I do both. That's not to say that some of my team wouldn't also do some directing. Um, in fact, at the BBC, for many years, there wasn't even a job title of director because it wasn't considered to be a separate skill. It was considered to be something that various people did um, and you weren't defined by that. So, yeah, in TV, producer-director is a thing. So somebody who is responsible for making the film and will also direct the camera. It might be that they shoot the stuff themselves as well. Increasingly, it's considered standard practice to be able to shoot um, TV stuff to a professional standard. There's a guy right at the back with his hand up. Somewhat follows on from the previous questions. But yeah. as far as the creative process mm -hmm. is concerned, um, where does where does the dynamic between the team as far as actually creating something that's intangible, where does that lie? Is it based on the person who's got experience in that field previously? Is Does it um, come as a result of research? Yeah, just a, a little bit of an insight okay. into that, please. Where do the ideas come from? Well, I always used to say to, when I was working in uh, actual commercial telly as opposed to teaching it, I always used to say to my teams that whatever you're called, you are all TV producers as far as I'm concerned. And you can all have ideas. And if you have a good idea, I'll absolutely use it. Okay? There's no point in sort of behaving in any other way. So um, it depends what program you are working on. So if there is a series of programs, generally, that series will have a sort of style, a kind of agreed house style. So you have to do things in a certain way. That's not to say that the way that you actually execute that isn't creative, but that to some extent will be decided if you are a producer who's responsible for one program in that series. Some of that creativity will be predefined and kind of it'll be there when you arrive. If you're working on a show like Horizon, which is a series of single programs, there isn't a kind of house style. So you, as the producer, in conversation with your executive producer will be the person who sets that style. And that's what's so interesting and challenging about that sort of program because you do, you know, if you go and work on, um, oh, I don't know, The Apprentice, say, it's a format, happens exactly the same way every week or Strictly Come Dancing. They even say the same things, you know, the judges, you can kind of more or less superimpose one program on the other and it's exactly the same and that to some extent happens in factual programs as well if you think about things like the repair shop which is an excellent and brilliant series by the way if you want to know how to do television watch the repair shop okay if you understand how to do that you can do anything but that's a format so you're not gonna you're not gonna kind of walk in as a director and go well, i'm not gonna do it like that i'm gonna do it in a different way i'm gonna do it all cinema scope and black and white they'll fire you. <laughs> so um, it depends what show you're working on. Single, single commissions tend to be much more, you have much more scope to think about how you're going to do it. I did get quite advanced in one horizon where I was going to do it as an animation, but it became too expensive. So you can do that. You can do, we did stuff with presenters, without presenters. I did a, I did a show with Jimmy Carr about the um, science of laughter which we did as a chat show. So, you know. Yes. Green top. Hi, um, really interesting, thank you. Um, I was interested in the, the other list, the science list. I yeah. hadn't realized it included quite so much stuff. Like archeology, span I wouldn't have put as science. So I like science. Is it, is it science? I don't know. I don't know. I'd have put it with history, but but where does that kind of... So it sounds like there is a lot of crossover with, with things. But I was interested, in, I mean, in your time, have you seen the evolution? So things like Country File, say, which was... I mean, does that still count as natural history? Because it's changed over the years um, to almost be quite mainstream from something that was kind of quite... and almost into current affairs. Where do things like that sort of fit, would you say? Well, it used to be presented by John Craven, didn't it? I mean, you can't get more current affairs than that. Mm. But it was um, certainly sort of had the, always had the It was farming the news, farming. wasn't it, yes. really? Yes. Um, Country File is made in Bristol, but it's not made by the NHU. It's made by Features in Bristol. Um, 
you know, I, I wouldn't say that when I talk about natural history, I think I'm talking about the sort of the blue chip stuff. So the the, the sort of Attenborough-esque kind of finding animals and their natural habitat and so on. I mean, all of these, as, as we've seen, you know, all of these definitions are slightly imprecise and fairly gray and porous. Um, but, you know, I, the, the thing is, if you're trying to make a TV program, you need to get it financed, right? So if you're an independent production company, you need to go to a commissioner and you need to get the money off them to make your program, okay? So the various commissioners and the various broadcasters, Netflix, all of those guys, have responsibility for pots of money and they are labeled <laughs> science, natural history, factual entertainment, comedy, drama. And so you need to be able to, this is way beyond the scope of this talk, but you need to be able to define what you're doing in one of those slate areas. So you can say, I'm making a program, it's actually anthropology, but there's a science angle to it. Let's go and see Jack Bootle, for example, at the BBC, who takes care of science and natural history. So just on that basis, that actually if someone were to pitch something like Country File now, it would yeah. probably struggle because it's a very sort of cross-cutting thing. And I guess from that would came things like the you know the Winter Watch, Spring Watch, for people interested in in that. Would you say is it would it would it be harder to now because it's a bit unspecific? Um, no, not necessarily. I mean, if there's a, if you come up with a format that that you know serves a need. Then people want to, if people are excited by it, they'll do it. But it's, I don't think that, well, would Countryfile be commissioned now? I don't know. It's hard to say, isn't it? Probably. You know, there isn't anything else like it, and it does seem to have a fairly loyal audience. Um, the Spring Watches, Winter Watch, the Watches, they call them. Um, they have acts two of them, haven't they? They only do, don't they, they do? They do, they've kept one of them. Win winter and summer yeah, or something. Yeah, some of them look quite yeah. sure. Why, Who cares um, about autumn and spring? Heaven's sake. Thank you. Dull. You first. I have a uh, degree in biology and a background in ecology. Um, right. So I have the opposite problem that was mentioned at the beginning, that right. I have no like filming experience. Um, yeah. But I'd really like to start somewhat of like a showreel. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to know what you thought about sort of starting out in a very low key sense. So okay. people have said it's okay, you can just pick up your phone or whatever you've got. Yeah. Um, so yeah, what do you so think really, about that? Really, really top question. Well done. And thank you for raising that. It's critically important. When I was recruiting people, um, when I worked at the BBC and at other places, I'd recruit people to work on our shows and they'd come in researchers, researcher level and I'd say, you know, and I'd say, what do you want to do? What's your plan? What do you want to do after this? Because I'd like to know a little bit about, you know, what their mindset is. And they always, almost always said, oh, I want, to, um, I want to be a producer. I want to make films. I want to direct. I want to do the kind of stuff that you're doing and so on. And I said, great, show us your films. It's kind of, what? Make films, honestly. One of the last ties I made before I went to the film school was a woman who hasn't got a background in science. She's got an English degree. She spent three years as a graduate trainee and then worked at Ogilvy in uh, marketing and advertising. Uh, but she'd made a film. And it was a lovely little film about her dad who was from Hong Kong and about the competitions he used to have with his brother making paper aeroplanes. She could also talk about science a bit. And I hired her. But I hired her largely because she'd made a film. And whoever told you that you can use your phone is absolutely right. You know, everybody's got a movie camera in their pocket now. You can download software for nothing. You know, or I mean, even Avid and, and all of those things are cheap, really. So, you know, make films, make films. Just, it, it doesn't matter if they're any good or not. And you'll learn from doing that. You know, there's nothing like trying to edit material that you've shot to teach you what you're doing wrong. Yeah, anything. Me and my friends went to the zoo. I don't know. Just start. I once saw an interview with Paul Simon, as in Simon and Garfunkel, and somebody said, what, can you, what advice would you give young songwriters? And he said, write songs. Okay? Don't think about it. 
don't think I really should be doing a mistake I made when I started working with videotape. You want to know what that is? <laughs> I was a videotape operator at the BBC hundreds of years ago. And I spent a couple of years sitting in the basement working with videotape thinking, why is nobody asking me to make films? You know, can't they see my genius flowing out of me? And of course they couldn't because probably wasn't there. But in any case, why would anybody come and say, I want you to make a film? Of course they won't. You have to go out there. You have to go out there, see people, seek advice. But make films. It's never been easier. Yeah? That, if you want to get into this caper, you don't necessarily have to make films about natural history or science either. You can if you want. If you want to be a show-off, great. But honestly, honestly, I can't say that strongly enough. Make films. If you're interested, if you're passionate about doing it. The other thing I would say, I'll come to you in a second, is that... I found myself making that pandemic show um, and we were, it was part drama, part documentary. So we were imagining the kind of patient zero in Southeast Asia and how the virus then spreads around the world. All a lot of fun. Anyway, we had hired a hotel on the Western Avenue and on the third floor, it's got three conference rooms and we had two conference rooms. One we dressed up as a White House press room because we wanted to have a scene with this American official saying he didn't know what was going on. Um, and then we had some interviews, some fake interviews going on with actors in a different room. And in the third room, there was, well, I don't know what it was, but kind of thrusting young men would kind of come out of this. And behind them, you could see somebody pointing at sales figures and they were all kind of like taking their ties off and they were all very thrusting stuff. And I did think, I can't, you know, I'd rather string myself up than work in a job like that. I couldn't do it. Here we are, you know, messing about with actors and having fun. And they're kind of like wondering if marketing have got the figures yet. You know, I just have to disembowel myself with a wooden spoon rather than do a proper job. Yes. All things. Uh, I'm Lydia. Thank Hi, you very Lydia. much. That was really interesting. Um, I was just wondering, because you were talking about the process of um, putting together a science documentary from kind of ideas and concepts to script to uh -huh. filming to editing. Is it the same when it comes to a natural history documentary or is it a little bit of a different order when you aren't quite sure exactly what you're going to get from all the filming? And is well, the filming actually much more you do okay. what you're going to get? So um, I would be lying if I said that I'd made lots of natural history films. I've made dinosaur shows, if that counts. Um, so, But the thing is that generally if you make a series like Planet Earth or Blue Planet or you know one of those things, there's a theme to it. All right. So if you're talking about Planet Earth 3, one of the episodes was fresh water. Right. So then you've kind of narrowed things down immediately. So you're going to talk about fresh water. You know, what are you going to talk about it? But what are you going to say about it? Um, what animals are you going to feature in it? And so on. Sometimes these things take an evolutionary approach so that you're looking at in each individual scene, you're looking at the evolution of the place, how the animal adapted to that, that area you know, how species have changed over time, you know, that kind of thing. I, natural history has a bit of a reputation, or if people want to knock natural history, they usually say, oh, it's just a list, isn't it? It's kind of, here's an animal doing a thing. Meanwhile, on the other side of the world, here's another animal doing something else. Um, and they hate that. Um, and justifiably too, because it's not quite true. There's usually some connection with it. But um, the programs tend to have a theme, and then the overall series will have a theme as well. So all of that is worked out. So what happens with a natural history series is that, um, not quite like this, but I just say it's like this for ease of explanation. People will have ideas. So Silverback or the NHU or whoever will then go to the commissioner, whose name is Sreya Biswas, and say, we've got an idea for this. And it'll all be worked out. And it'll be, we want to do a thing about mountains. And we want to look at the animals and the mountain ranges across the world. Episode one is this, episode two is this, and so on. So it'll be all mapped out. And then the producer of each individual program will have to then make that happen. And the trick is to make sure that you don't overpromise. 